So, our next speaker is Marcus Bristol from PushPay. Hi, I'm Marcus, and as you can tell from my shirt, I'm from PushPay. We're a payments company, and uh, we operate under uh, using continuous delivery. And we push to production up to a dozen times a day. Now, we need to get this right. People get a little antsy if you screw up their money. So I'm going to tell you how we do this, how we can deploy so often and minimize any, any production incidents. But before I start, I'm going to tell you a little story. Now, this story isn't really appropriate for a conference, but we're all friends here, right? Just if there's anyone here from PushPay, can you just cover your ears for a couple of minutes? Now, when I was young, well, when I was younger, maybe about 25, 30 years ago, my mates and I used to hit the town on a Friday night. And we used to go shopping in a big department store. I think it was called Decker back in the day. And we used to spend all night shopping using a five-finger discount. Or, as you all know, shoplifting. And it wasn't just one or two things. So it was mainly snack food. It was mainly just junk food because we were kids. But we'd fill up our bag. We would then go and stash, stash our stuff somewhere and go back and then fill up the bag again. And this went on for months until eventually the inevitable happened and we were caught. We were taken down to the cop shop and thankfully, thankfully I was let off with a warning. But I wasn't told that until after they'd taken me a tour of, of the prison cells and suggested that I might end up spending the night there. That was my first big real-world introduction to what I now know as just culture. Now this guy here, Sidney Decker, he talks about just culture a lot. I'm going to quickly skim over a few of the points, but if you want to know more information, print out this picture, hunt him down and stalk him, or just visit that website down there. <laughs> so what is just culture? Just culture is a culture of trust, learning and accountability. We want to balance safety and accountability. We want our developers to be able to push changes into production without fear of any kind of rip amount, without fear of getting fired potentially, but we still want them to be held accountable for the changes that they do. Simply boiled down, it's a culture that allows the boss to hear bad news. It allows them to hear that somebody's broken production and it comes up with a way to be able to deal with it. Now what I had back 25, 30 odd years ago is what's known as a retributive, I'm going to mess this word up, right? it's a retributive just culture. And when some kind of incident happens, what we look at then is what rule was broken? Who did it? How bad was the breach? And what should the consequences be for that breach? And who gets to decide this? So back in the day, the rule was quite obvious. I was stealing. I was breaking the law. Who did it? Well, again, that was obvious. I was caught in the act. How bad was the breach? Well, they didn't know about my history, all the months and months of stealing. They just knew it was a Moro bar or something they caught me with. That's all they knew about. So the breach was quite small, and therefore the consequence was fairly minimal. And who gets to decide this? It is the people who are working for the law, the people who are trying to enforce the law. But it doesn't always have to be some kind of jail term, some kind of, of harsh repercussion like that. It could be as simple as, I don't know, smoking behind the bike shed at school with the risk of maybe detention or suspension. Whatever it is, what it's doing is it's meeting hurt with hurt. It's saying, if you're going to go and do something bad, if you're going to do some kind of unacceptable behaviour, this is the repercussion for doing that. And it's, it's, not always, it's not always really clear cut. At one point, I was working for a fairly large company in New Zealand. I won't tell you who they are, but it's it one, one of the bigger companies here. And they had a blanket policy for their developers in that you have to have less than 10% of your changes causing a production defect. All right, so if you have more than 10% of your changes causing a production defect, that is going to impact your bonus, and you're not going to get as, as much of a bonus at the end. Now, 
on the surface, this seems okay, all right? This is, helps to minimize production issues. But it made people scared to make changes. It made people scared to, to push changes to production. And what ended up happening was that people stopped working. And people still, because they weren't deploying to production, they had, by default, less than 10% defect rate, and so everyone got a bonus. But we had no changes going to production. At PushPay, we, we want changes. We want to continuously evolve. We want to continuously learn. So we work under a restorative just culture. And when an incident does happen in a restorative culture, we look at who is hurt, what do they need to recover, and whose obligation is it to meet that need, and most importantly, how do you involve the wider community uh, in, in that conversation? How do you generate learning for the, for the company to try and avoid this situation from happening again? Now, again, I've got a story that perhaps I shouldn't be saying at a conference. My boss isn't here, so I'm quite safe. It happened a week or two after I started at PushPay. My boss was in the our BI database, and he was running some reports. Now, we, because we're a payments company, we're PCI compliant, we've got a lot of privacy issues that we need to look after, a lot of security issues. So the data in our BI database is sanitized so that we can't associate the information we see with any particular person. And he was in the BI database and he was running these reports, and he happened to notice that the data was full of names and phone numbers and everything. So something had obviously gone wrong with the sanitization script. So in a panic, he quickly ran it. And then what he realized, he had two problems. The first was that he wasn't actually in the BI database at all, he was in production. <laughs> and he had just wiped out all our customer data. And secondly, there was a protection in the script so that if it, if it ever was run in production, it would throw an error. That protection had never ever been tested. Right, so in other companies I work for, this, this is, could be an automatic firing offence. We've just destroyed all this data. But at PushPay, what we did is we looked at those values. We looked at how we can heal this and how we can learn as a company going forward. So in our restorative uh, just culture, we meet hurt with healing. We try and fix the problem and we try to move forward. We never ever believe that it's the individual's fault. If something happens, to cause a situation like that, it's always something wrong with the process, something wrong with, with the, the environment. It is never, ever the person's fault. And we work as hard as we can to go and fix that so that nobody will ever, ever make that mistake again. And we do this with a, using a blameless post-mortem. Now, this underpins everything that we do. Everything that we do is built upon this. We stole this from Etsy, and we're using it ourselves. Uh, I'll provide a link later on if you want some more information about how Etsy do it. But basically what happens is when there's an incident in production, the engineer who caused that incident will give a detailed account of what actions they took at the time, what effects they observed when they made that action, what they expected when they did it, because obviously what happened isn't what they expected, which caused the incident. Any assumptions that they made at the particular time, and their understanding of the timeline of events. And they can do all this without fear of punishment or retribution. They know that we're not going to fire them, that we're all going to work together as a group to go and fix this problem and to put something in place to stop this from ever happening again. So when do we do a blameless post-mortem? Basically, whenever there is an opportunity to learn. Whenever we can improve the system and improve our processes to make it a safer working environment for our team. Often that's when there's an impact to production, but often it's also when there's a near miss. So there's been times when somebody's taken our test environment down, for example. We will do a blameless post-mortem then to learn from it and to avoid that mistake from ever happening in production. We do this in a written format. Imagine most of you have been in a meeting where the extroverts kind of take over the meeting. You know, they're loud people, and they tend to be the ones that make all the decisions. While 
uh, the, more, the more introverted people, the quiet people, who have a lot of knowledge and a lot to give, sit, sit quietly in the corner. So we write everything down, and that gives them the opportunity to have their voice. They've got important stuff to say, they've got important learnings to give, and we want to make it possible for them to be able to, to get involved in the discussion. All right, so I'm going to show you one here. Now, hopefully, that's too small for you to read, otherwise I might get into trouble. This is actually the post-mortem that was done when my boss sanitised the production database. So we start off at the top with a summary of what happened. So this is what happened. And this basically is, is normally just a one-liner. And then that person who did it, because the person, the, the engineer who made, uh, who caused that incident, is normally the one who knows most about it. And so they're normally in charge of writing up this post-mortem. And they'll put together a timeline of events. You know, what happened when, who did what, who knew what at the time, and then we'll just put together a, a little timeline of what happened. Next, we'll do an impact assessment. So who was hurt? You know, who was affected by this particular change? And in that one, basically it was everyone. The whole platform went down. And so we put together an impact assessment and find out what damage there has been and who needs help to get it resolved. And then as a group, we come together and we have a discussion about what happened and come up with ways that we could do to, that we can implement to stop this from ever happening again. And then that will generate uh, mitigations. So that's changes to the system, changes to the process to stop this exact same problem from ever happening again. It's okay if it happens once, it's not really okay if it happens twice. We've missed something. And normally the mitigations have to be done within three or four days of uh, this document being finalised. So that, that forms the bedrock. That allows the engineers to have a, a safety blanket. They know that they can make changes without fear of any kind of repercussion. They're still accountable for the change, and if something goes wrong, they still need to work through that post-mortem and lead the company in fixing the issue, but they know that they can do this without fear of being fired. But sitting on top of that, we have a lot of processes in place to make this role a lot easier, to be able to uh, make these changes in, in a safe way. The first one, the mo probably the most important one, is feature flags. Does anyone not know feature flags? There's a couple. All right, I'll add a quick little demo. So any change that we do, we put behind, behind the feature flag, and that allows us to roll it out in a safe way. So I have this application here that it's a really, really important critical application that will display Hello World. Uh, there we go. So you can see here we've got Hello World coming out. But I want to change that to my, my shiny new thing, right? And so we have this concept of feature flags. And so we have a file here for each, each environment. And as you can see, the files are all empty at the moment. Uh, we have a simple command that we wrote ourselves. Everything we do, we go for the minimal viable option. So we do the simplest thing possible to get us to where we need to be. And at the moment, the simplest thing possible is just this tiny little script that we wrote. So we have this command here, uh, features command, to go and add a shiny new thing, uh, feature flag, and then that goes and updates these files. So you can see here, we now have a sh my shiny new thing, and I've turned it on here for dev, and it's off for production and off for test. So now we have this feature flag in place, we can look to start using it and start to make changes to our production system. So what we'll do is we'll start with a simple if block where we've duplicated the, the code that we, want to, um, uh, that we want to update. In this situation, we don't care about dry principles, if anyone's heard of that. What we care about is the risk of updating it. We want to be able to maintain it. We want to be able to remove that feature flag sometime in the future. So we don't care about having duplicate code here like this. 
And then we wrap that up in an if block and we pull in the features. So we have this my shiny new thing feature here. So when the shiny new thing feature flag is on, it'll do what's in the top block, and when it's off, it'll do what, uh, the bottom block. And then that allows us to go and make changes to this top block you know, without breaking what's existing. Now, if all goes well, uh, we'll just change that to div. Okay, so now we're in the dev environment, and if I run this application, we've got my shiny new thing come out. If I switch over to test, and then it's doing uh, the old code. So that means that we can work on new features on our local machine, push them out to production, uh, with them deactivated, and we can evolve that feature over time, and then only when we're ready, we can turn that on in production when we need to. So we use feature flags a lot. We've got this new thing called science that we're just starting to play with. It's built on top of the feature flags, and it's for critical pieces of code that have no side effects, and what we'll do is we'll run the code first with the feature flag off, and then we'll run it with the feature flag on, and we'll compare the results uh, for both for the output and for uh, performance issues. And we'll monitor that for a period of time before we actually go and turn it on in production. So this is kind of similar to a unit test, but it's using real live uh, user data. And we can prove that the changes are OK before we, before we activate them. We work with lots and lots of small PRs. So as soon as you start working on something, you'll create a PR, you'll commit early, and you'll commit often. This allows the rest of the engineering team, who, the people there who care about the feature you're working on, to watch this feature evolve over time. We tend to only have our PRs live for a day or two, and so we're always merging back into the main trunk. This is so that our code is always consistent with what's in production. Some of you may have worked with feature branches, and if it's a long-running feature branch, it can get quite separate from the mainline trunk, and when you've got to merge it back in, it's a merging nightmare. And all your testing and everything is to start again because it's a completely different code base. If we keep moving quickly, and iterating quickly, and then we're never going to diverge too far from uh, what's in production. We do lots of code reviews. So when you've finished working on your PR, so this is after a day's work, you'll mark it ready for review, and somebody in your team, so we work in small teams of five or six people, somebody in your team will do a code review. So every line of code that goes into production has been code reviewed at least once. We WOM a lot. Now, I know in the keynote, Raquel said WOMing is bad, but we've kind of twisted it and made it a good thing. So WOM is works on my machine. And what we do here is when we finish working on a particular feature, what we'll do is we'll call one of our QAs over. So there's a, there's a quality assistant in every single team. We'll call them over, sit at your desk, you hand them the keyboard, and then they'll go and test it on your machine. This is because the earlier you find a defect, the quicker it is to fix and the cheaper it is to fix. And quite often when they find something, yeah, oh, I'm an idiot grab the keyboard back, quickly fix it, hand it back, and then they'll retest it, and it'll work. So we pick up the majority of our errors before we even push it to the remote repository by doing this, this peer testing. We do automated testing. I imagine most of you need to do automated testing. We do lots and lots and lots of it. We do unit tests. We do JavaScript tests. We do acceptance testing, where we start up Selenium and simulate users' work going through the, the process. We have Raygun tests, which test the API. We have a perpetual diff test, which has taken a snapshot of the pages in our platform um, before, and then a snapshot now, and compares them. I mean, CSS is really, really easy to do, right? But it's also really, really easy to screw up, especially when you're a back-end dev like me. 
And you can make a small tweak here and it's going to go and change this page over here. So we, we have protection around that as well. So we, we have tons and tons of tests. So what that does is that allows our QAs to do exploratory testing. So we'd be upset if they sat down and they tried to make a payment through the system because that's all covered. What we want them to do is try as best as they can to break it, and they are really good at breaking it. We did a thing called pollination. So once we've merged our changes into the main trunk, someone from another team is assigned to review it. So when I said every line of code gets reviewed at least once, that was kind of true, but every line of code gets reviewed at least twice, first before the merge and secondly after it. This helps encourage collaboration between the knowledge of our engineers and it adds a double safety blanket so that more eyes have been on that piece of code and it also shares the knowledge of the features with the other teams. So when we found a year, 18 months ago, that when we were working in these teams before we introduced pollination, that we're getting siloed. So this team will look after this feature and then no one else will knew about it. This team will look after another feature. And we wanted a way to be able to share that knowledge amongst the team and we do this with a pollination. So every change we do is reviewed generally at least twice. And we have bots. We have lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of bots. And bots are fun, I love bots. We have engineering bots, we have sales bots, we have bots that tell us when we have new customers, when payments are being made. I'm going to quickly show you through some of the, what I find the more interesting ones, the ones around um, the, the technical stuff that we do. For example, I spoke about feature flags, which are really, really useful, but it'd be even more useful if somebody could dynamically turn it on and off and test so that they could do a before and after type scenario. So we can do that. We have a QA bot that reports whenever somebody goes into our QA environment and changes the feature flag. So that tells you what the feature flag is, what state it's in now, when it was done, and by whom. This is all put into Slack. I assume everyone here knows about Slack now. Uh, we use Slack as our central hub for all our communication. We pull information in from every other platform, Jira and Confluence and Rayguns and GitHub, and we put it all into Slack, so we've got one thing to look at. I mentioned that we do testing. We have a build bot here that monitors our tests. So each one of those acronyms is a different test suite, from acceptance tests to run scopes to unit tests. And every time we deploy to QA, it goes through the suite of tests, and you can see that green tick slowly moving to the left as all the tests pass. I should have probably found a one with an error, so you could see that, but it's just got a big red X, and then that's the one we need to go and look at. So every time a test status changes, the build bot will go and pick it up and put it into Slack so that we can monitor it. We deploy all our stuff using Octopus Deploy, so we've got an Octa Hipster, a bot, that monitors those deployments and it alerts us when uh, something has been deployed to QA or to production. We use Raygun for exception handling, and at the bottom there are all our links to the different Raygun environments so that we can go and actively monitor it once we've had a production release. We've got Vadim McShipface that monitors GitHub, and every time we make a change to GitHub, so we mark APR as ready for review, or we merge it into master, it comes up into Slack, into the team's Slack channel, and it tells them all about it. We have a B-Bot. This is for our pollinations. And it monitors how, how quickly the pollinations have been done and how many are outstanding. So as I mentioned, we need to do them within three and four days. That bottom one there is 14 days old, and I screen grabbed that two days ago. So we're over two weeks now, so I'm getting into trouble. The bot doesn't like me much. We have a health monitor which checks the API, checks production, makes sure that everything is, is running normally. We have pony hipsters. As you might have guessed, we're big on ponies. And this gives details about who's in each, each team. This is a fairly new utility type one that we have. We have C3PR. 
which is probably one of my favorite ones. Uh, C3PR looks after the deployments to production. So if you've seen the Spotify engineering videos uh, about the engineering culture, they'll talk about a train or a ship. I think there's a ship analogy. And we borrowed that process. We put it into Slack and then we built a bot around it too to help automate it. And C3PR is what we called it and that looks after it. I'll give you a quick demo of that in a sec. I'll bring this back up in a minute, but this is, this is a lot of the information that we used that we referenced to go and put together our culture, to, to learn from other people's mistakes, to learn from their learnings, to pull it into our company and to implement uh, what was appropriate for us. All right, I'll bring that back up in a sec. Let's see if I can get. Right. I think this is going to be an internet issue. I thought if I try again. Often, right, in a demo, you try a second time and it works, but no, not today. It's, um, yeah, it can't connect to the internet. All oh, right, because I hit cancel. I think you're right there. All right, if everyone can just cross their fingers. What do you reckon? <laughs> awesome. Okay, can everyone see that right? So we use the channel topic, just right at the top there, uh, as our persistent data so that when we reboot C3PR, it remembers uh, we haven't had the need yet to do offline storage, but that is very quickly coming. And so if I join this train, you'll see that right at the top there, it's added me to the, to the front carriage. If I add someone else, it'll put them into a separate carriage. So the carriages are delimited by, by those bars. If I add someone else, You can see there's now, now two people on that second carriage. And so we use this as a way to manage uh, deployments into production, who's shipping what. The person in the front is the, the driver of the train, and they, they control uh, what goes in, who can join the train, what changes are going into production, and they're responsible for uh, making sure that everything gets deployed OK. So we start off with a roll call, make sure that everyone's there, if I spell ready right. So now it says you can merge your stuff. So now I can go and merge all my PRs into, um, into master. And then I hit ready. This will then automatically kick off the build, which will send it off to um, our Team City. We'll do the build. Octopus Deploy will then deploy it to our test environments. And then it will start off that huge suite of automated testing that you saw. Once I've tested it in QA and everything, and then uh, our market is ready, we deploy it to production, and then we go and do some production uh, verification tests, make sure everything's ready, and, and then I give it up to the next carriage. And that's essentially it. Pull that up again. I do have time for questions. We're out of time. Yeah, you can skip. You got some time. Okay, I've got time for questions if anyone's got any. Um, Hi. Um, how do you manage uh, the of, or the ex excess of information flow coming in? I mean, the Slack stuff is really cool. 
Um, we have a lot of email notifications where I work. But it gets to the point where um, you stop looking and, and someone will say if it's something's really bad because there's just too much information. So how do you manage what you've got as opposed to the idea of having a dashboard perhaps where it's in the room, maybe no one's looking, but if something goes red, they'll know. Yep. So that's a very big concern uh, that we have. So we've stopped using email because we use Slack for everything now, which has been super handy. We pull everything into Slack to avoid the overhead of having to go to all these different systems, to remember what these different systems are, to remember the logons for them, and to try and monitor them. Pull everything into one central place to look at it. We still do have the problem where we get an information overload. It wasn't so bad when there was 10 of us, and now there's 90 of us. It's, it's getting really noisy. So we're working on different ways to, be, to compress that. So either have smaller messages with quicker status updates. So this one here, if I can get back to it quickly. This used to be a line for each of the tests with some status results. And we're getting, when we increased from about a year ago, we had 30 developers, now we've got 90. The number of changes to production has increased by um, 25%. So each engineer is doing 25% more deploys, even though we've got a much bigger headcount. So you can imagine that we've got a lot more stuff going on. And so this got really, really noisy. So what we did is we found a way to compress it down so that it gave the same amount of information, but in a much more compressed format to make it easier to, um, to absorb. We're still working on this. We're still trying to minimize the data and decide what is the relevant data we need to provide. So it is, it is an ongoing issue. Yep. Uh, who runs your blameless um, uh, postmortems? So is it the developer who uh, caused the problem, or is it do you have another function in yeah, the team that does it? It's the engineer who's in charge of that particular release. So if I made a change that resulted in issue in production, I'd be the one in charge of looking after that postmortem. Sometimes we get advice from our peers when we should do it. So if we have an issue in QA, it's not always clear cut whether we should do a postmortem on it or not. Often we don't, but if we decide there's going to be enough learning from it, we will collaborate as a team, decide that we're going to do it, and if we do do a postmortem, it is still the engineer who, who looks after it. They're responsible for making sure that there's mitigations and that those mitigations are done within a week or two. One more back here. Uh, it sounds like you uh, review everything pretty thoroughly. Do you ever run into the problem where you've got so many things to review and you don't want to, like, it just stops people from starting new things because then you get too much work in progress? We do have some developers who love writing code. They'll go home and they'll spend all night writing code. They just live and breathe it and they come up with some really, really big PRs. So we do get into situations where you spend a lot of time uh, reviewing, reviewing code rather than writing code. But at the end of the day, our job isn't to write code. Our job is to deliver value to the customer. Part of that value is reviewing other people's code. That is really, really important to us. And we do make it a, a top priority to do that. We manage it by having, trying to have small PRs with, a lot, with small commits. If it is fairly big, and then we'll often sit down with a developer and, and go through it and collaborate on it together, make sure that's okay, and that just um, improves the speed of the process. Hi, thanks. Um, how is the code review process um, different from your pollination? Because um, I, I would have thought that the code review would be sufficient if you include people from other teams to, to get them across the work that you're doing. Why is pollination still necessary for, for sort of awareness of, of that work? Is, is, is there something different between the two? Yeah, that's a good question. They have, a code review has to be done before it gets merged and, and it gets landed. So a code review is right then, right now, and that's really important. Pollination is done after the fact, so the code's already in production. A big part of the pollination is to share the knowledge amongst the team. So other people from other teams have different ideas of how to solution the code or even different skills within the language and they're able to share that knowledge uh, across the different cells uh, through the pollination. 
we're able to share the knowledge of the different features that people are working on uh, through the pollinations. And they, in my opinion, they're, they're the biggest wins. Often they do catch errors as well because it's, it's essentially a second code review. And that's why we, we'd like to get them done within a, a few days. If you leave them 14 days, like I've got, they're starting to get a bit too, a bit too long. The code's already been in production a couple of weeks and the longer it's there, the less value there is in the pollination. But it's more about team sharing and collaboration. Cool, that's uh, all the time we've got for, for this session.